afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for staying here and joining us for our breakout session, Predictive Tools to Protect Maine's Woods and Waters. I'm Kate Simmons. I'm Director of Partnerships here at the Rubin Institute at Northeastern University. And it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel. Because not only has she always had her eye on the future, she's always had her eye on how we can all work together to make the future better for the people. So, Hannah Pingree, from always serving on her local school board, to chairing the State Appropriations Committee, to serving as the, state, the speaker of the Maine State House of Representatives, she's collaborated with people across the state to solve our most pressing issues, including things like access to affordable housing, access to broadband, combating climate change, and supporting our aging population. So, um, she currently is the director of Governor Mills' Office of Policy Innovation and Energy. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Hannah Pinkley. All right, well, good to see you all today. Um, I did, uh, just by the theme of this panel, uh, I live on an offshore island and I took care of this morning. Uh, that finally went after 24 hours of hurricanes due to the uh, high winds, so it's great to be here with you all. So we're talking about predictive tools to protect Maine woods and waters. So for the first time ever, an AI session is being completed in the Maine Innovation Economy Plan, set to be released later this year. The document aligns AI and Maine with global priorities, but they include environmental protection and precision agriculture. Yeah. The State of Maine IA report highlights the diversity of AI applications and the implications and opportunities, including for Maine's heritage industries. We're talking today about our woods and our waters. In the Northern Maine woods and the Gulf of Maine, AI is helping experts tackle unrivaled challenges from climate change to the energy crisis. The panel discussion will highlight how leaders across the state, among the most rural state in the country, are applying powerful predictive tools to protect our natural resources and our industries. So as our state and world tackle, tackle the complicated challenges of climate change and predicting the impacts to our environment, our communities and our economy, the question is also how can AI applications help support our decisions and our actions? So I'll just say that we have an awesome panel here today. I think inspired by Aaron, so thank you uh, for, for prodding this along. And I have had had a couple of good conversations with the folks on the panel. And I've learned about um, hot algorithms, algorithm accountability, moving from a data poor to a data overwhelmed environment in our oceans. Um, so I think this is an incredible panel uh, to talk about an issue that I have a feeling your average forester, some people out harvesting lumber, your average fisherman in a community like where I live have no idea about the AI applications that are going to be impacting their industries. So I'm going to quickly um, introduce our four uh, awesome panelists. They're going to each give you just a couple minutes about how AI is impacting our forests and our oceans. And then we're going to get into a couple more questions. So think of your burning questions. Um, so first to my right, we have Nick Greger, who directs the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. He's a senior research, source, research scientist at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Science. In this role, he uses big data, mathematical models, and machine learning to help predict diverse ocean phenomena ranging from toxic algae blooms to whale migrations. He's particularly interested in ocean data justice and understanding how the use of data and algorithms can shape the way ocean research impacts people. Next, we've got Ashley Blander, who gets, I, I would say, at least the main award for the longest drive to the snowiest conditions to get here, uh, coming down from Northern Maine. She's a continuous improvement specialist with Ted J.D. Irvin. She has a master's in mechanical engineering from the University of New Brunswick, and she's a mechanical engineering degree from New England. She's been working with J.D. Irving to incorporate AI technology into sawmill manufacturing lines, which can help identify lower spaces and detect, detect defects. Next, Aaron Whitescale directs the Center for Research and Sustainable Forests. He's a professor of forest biometrics and modeling, and he's the J.D. Irving Chair of Forest Ecosystem Management at UMAIN. His AI research focuses on three key areas, the deployment of smart environmental sensors, high-resolution mapping of forest types, and large-scale prediction of alternative features. And last but not least, Mark Hager is the founder of the New England Maine Marine Monitoring, which provides fisheries, technology, systems, and services. 
In this role, he uses computer vision to monitor fish populations in the Gulf of Maine. His current projects include monitoring ground fish discards and landings, and implementing, implementing new traceability tools with Maine and seafood companies. So I'm just going to ask them each to talk for a couple of minutes about how uh, they each utilize AI in advancing the mission of their business and their organization, and just talk, starting off a little bit about the opportunities. Hold the mic at your mouth. All right. So Mark, we're going to let you start. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, I think with the bad news, I'm going to say that AI in woods and water is really hard. Um, I want to get that out of the way. Um, it's not a factory setting with perfect lighting in a conveyor belt in perfect conditions. It's, it's really challenging. Um, and I did a talk at the Atlanta Aquarium last week, and I focused on that, and it was a wet blanket talk, so I'm getting it out of the way now. And now I'm going to talk about it's some of the successes of that. No. Yes, positivity from now on. Um, so in our business, we put cameras on commercial fishing boats uh, on the deck, and they record actually what's happening on the operation deck of a fishing boat. And we count how many fish they caught, where they caught them, and how they caught them. We record that, that video comes in, and we spend hundreds of thousands of hours watching that video. So we have developed some tools to help us get through that video faster. Um, we've developed some activity recognition tools where you can uh, the machine learning will actually tell us when the net went in the water and then when the net came out of the water, when there's people on deck, when they open the fish hole and put the fish down below. And that helps our staff get through the, the video a lot faster. They can kind of cut some of the boring space when you're fishing because you're not always catching fish. Um, we've also developed other tools that have to do species ID on deck, so identifying an actual species that are being caught. Um, and uh, even further, we walked up even further when we got to the point where we put a mask around the edge of the boat and we started to detect as objects went flying overboard as they were getting thrown back what species those were. Because um, one of those things we're doing is trying to document if the species are getting discarded are all the species to be discarded. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time um, working on trying to use AI to create efficiencies in our video review process um, in fishing. Um, so that's, that's one example of how we're using AI, and that, that's been pretty successful. Um, we still have a long way to go, but it's a lot, a lot of good success there. Um, from that, we spun out kind of a new use case for, for some of the tools that we had started to build. And I'm going to ask a quick question to the audience. Um, if I were to hold up a cod fish fillet and a haddock fillet, would you guys be able to tell me which one is which? Anyone in the audience? Maybe, maybe. Oh, yeah, someone, thank you. Someone raised their hand. I knew there'd be someone fishing in the audience. Um, so, I used the sample for the federal level. Excellent. I like it. Awesome. Um, and there might be a couple more people in the audience if they too. But generally, it's pretty challenging. Um, and there's been a bunch of reports. One in 2019 showed that seafood initially went from one species to the other is happening at a rate of about 20% at the point of sale. So pretty high rate of seafood mislabeling, which causes problems in the in the market, causes problems for um, for environmental concerns where you're actually trying to manage a fishery. You don't know how many removal coming out of the fishery. There's health concerns, and, and ultimately, yeah, as consumers, if we buy a fillet fish, they want it to be with what, what says it. Um, so we adapted the work we we're doing on whole fish to fillets, and we have a trained algorithm to actually. Look at the muscle tissue of the fish in a fillet. We, we partnered with uh, local Portland, Maine seafood companies, uh, Crystal Seafood and True Pen Seafood, and we recorded thousands and thousands of Im images of fish. And we actually annotated with our professional, uh, our truly trained staff, exactly what species those fillets came from. And in our initial study, we had a 99% accuracy telling the difference between cod, haddock, and mullet. Which are all the Gavin family, pretty challenging to tell apart for the, for the average consumer. Um, that work's ongoing. Uh, we're developing it into an app so that it can be uh, on a mobile phone, so pretty much it allows anywhere in the supply chain someone to use that. Uh, and this is really an alternative to DNA testing. Uh, DNA testing is, is a really effective way to do it, but it's, it's slow, it's expensive. Usually, by the time you get the results, the suspicion might be after the key supply chain. So what we're working on now is kind of speed that up. Um, and we have a long way to go with it, but it's a really exciting uh, new project for us. And it, it's fun out of just, you know, an existing AI we're doing the whole thing. 
Okay, I think I'm next. We're, we're sticking with the ocean. Ocean first, and then loops. Okay, uh, so I'm Nick. I work at um, Bigelow Lab, which is a nonprofit independent lab in Mid Coast, Maine. We do um, both foundational and solutions based research uh, related to the ocean climate. And I want to tell you about two things in my ocean, in my uh, ocean, my opening remarks. One is just some of the work I'm doing, and then uh, some of the opportunities that I see for Maine and the Gulf of Maine in this sort of AI space, and we sort of wanted to the themes of the day. So, okay, so for me first, uh, as Hannah mentioned, I direct the center called the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. We launched the center a couple of years ago, and um, it's kind of like uh, anything about the ocean that you that you might want to forecast. We, we work with stakeholders in industry, in management, in communities to, uh, to figure out what it is that, that they want to be able to predict. And then we kind of work with them all, all, all throughout the process and develop uh, data collection, algorithms, and that sort of thing to give them the, uh, the forecasting tools that they need. So for example, uh, we have a, a toxic alga forecast for the aquaculture industry uh, up and down the coast of Maine. It gives a weekly uh, probability of closure level toxicity, and that uses, uh, uses a neural network. I guess I can say that and people know what that is in this audience. Uh, it uses a neural network to, uh, is trained on environmental and other toxicity data to make those uh, predictions one week ahead of time. And um, that forecast is at a pretty mature state. It's live, it's online, and we, and we still constantly get feedback from the industry on uh, its usefulness, its reliability, uh, and things like that. Another example, we're also uh, sort of neck deep in this whale lobstering controversy, uh, which I love to talk about to everybody. Um, but uh, our role has to do with uh, one, of the, one of the challenges with the, the, um, the managing of this controversy is that in coastal Maine, we have pretty big data gaps in some of the areas where really important decisions are being made. And the uh, uncertainty around those data gaps winds up being a really contentious area of data. So we're using some of our machine learning algorithms to pull together new data sources to fill in those gaps so that that information can work its way into the models that NOAA uses to make these decisions. So ho hopefully we can uh, improve the, the process just by filling in um, some, of the, some of the gaps that are, that are like, not all of the controversies about data gaps. Like, that's one place where AI can be um, and so those are a couple of examples. We, we, we have sort of taken this stakeholder-centered approach that I was describing where we begin the process by working with stakeholders. And now that we have done this with a few different projects in Maine, um, we're starting to get projects around the country and around the world, especially with aquaculture. A couple of us just came back from um, Morocco in December where we were working with uh, aquaculture industry there to develop similar um, algorithms and pipelines to build with that. Uh, so that's the that's the Tandy Center and the forecasting that we are doing. In terms of opportunities for for Maine, um, Hannah also touched on this. Ocean science has is going through this transition right now from a from a pretty data limited field to now we're drowning, so to speak, in, in data. And this, this transition has followed that same transition in a lot of other industries. When I first started in ocean science, people were you know, still paying $2 million to go out on a boat and collect like five data points. And now we have uh, autonomous buoys, autonomous gliders, which are like underwater drones. We have environmental DNA, which is pulling in you know, tons and tons of genomic data from the environment. And so now we kind of have the opposite problem where we have more data than we have uh, data scientists to, to sort of work it out. And I think that could be a big opportunity in Maine because for one, we have the Gulf of Maine, which is one of the fastest uh, changing environments on the planet, as Dr. Stent mentioned in her opening remark this morning. So what we can learn here is valuable for the rest of the world. And then the other thing that I think make, makes Maine special is that we have communities in Maine who are really closely tied to the environment we have a lot of local uh, ecological knowledge, uh, in some, some cases multi-generational knowledge. And that goes back to this thread that a lot of people have brought up throughout the day, is you don't want to just develop these uh, AI algorithms from the top down. You want to be working with users, you want to be working with stakeholders, so that the decisions that the, that the AI is assisting with don't, don't wind up with these built-in biases or unintended. 
And so we also have this really, these really special communities in Maine when it comes to using AI in the natural world. Uh, and so that's one of the one of the things that I love about it, is working with those communities as we develop the algorithms. And I think that that's something that as AI moves forward and we see more opportunities for applying it in the natural world, um, those communities as partners will be really important. And that's something that we've had in the end of the day. It's really special. Great. Ashley. You know we're going to switch gears from water to the woods. Um, I'm actually Ballinger, I'm a continuous improvement specialist at Ashland Sawmill at the edge of North Maine Woods. Um, we use AI to help us improve the quality of the lumber that we're processing and use some forecasting data and customer demands and historical numbers that way to help us figure out what we're making in the sawmill in order to meet the customer demands. Um, one of my other roles at the mill is currently our kiln supervisor, so one of my favorite uses of AI at our mill is an uh, upgrade we got a couple of years ago um, called SpecPro that helps us with our species identification. It sounds very similar to some of the um, ocean um, uses that we just heard about. But we used to tell, well, way before I got there, we used to tell fur from the spruce by an operator standing on the line and marking the board, and it would be dependent on him to identify which was which. When I got there, we were using a chemical that would be sprayed on the edge of the board, and based on the pH, it would turn a different sheet of blue, and we would tell that way. Um, a couple of years ago, we got the upgrade that uses AI imagery, and now we went from um, about 85% accurate to closer to 98, 99% accurate, and that's had a huge impact on our drying and the end quality and the quality of our customers again. Um, our Fur typically takes about 150 hours for drying our film, and this works is closer to 90 hours. You can see um, the business impact there of having the improved, um, improved species separation. Um, one of the opportunities that I see that the last panel touched on is the education and letting our students know about the opportunities that are existing like this in our business because I grew up in the county and I did not realize until I got a call from Urban one day, they got hold of my resume, I didn't know that this was an option for me. Um, so just making sure that our high school students, elementary school students are aware and they know they have to move away to have some of these jobs. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Eric. Right. Thanks for being here on a Friday night in January. Uh, I'll try to keep it. Brief. It's the data corral. I can give you a few data points. Correct. All right. So north of here, it's about 17 million acres of forest. It's 89 percent of the land area. Get rid of the water. It's about 24 million acres. Okay. Uh, so that's the highest state in the U.S. in terms of production area of forest. About five percent of the main GDP is directly tied to the forest. We do recreation, we do neighbors, we do development in here and elsewhere. The number might be a little bit higher. Also, more importantly, we talk about carbon neutrality. Uh, the main forest currently has about 60 to 75 percent of the state's emissions right now. So, I think if anything, we talk about Maine's economy, it's going to talk about moving the forest, or whether we're talking about carbon neutrality or growing the economy of the forest. I think two other key data points are also one is Maine's national leader right now on climate action. A lot to do that in the office, and you can get those changes for that. And we should be really proud of that to do that effort. I mean, another important part, and big kudos to uh, Jay Irvin. Um, not only are they one of the most innovative data driven companies in the main, today, at least in the forest industry sector, both locally and regionally, nationally, I would say worldwide. We're in the top five. It's an incredible company. They're now managing for us in the remote sensing, AI, making large decisions of about 12 or 7 million acres with regular information. So at the University of Maine, the Center for Research and Planning the Forest, what we're going to do is you leverage AI that we uh, primarily two things. One, it provides data products uh, to make better decisions uh, on our forest. I've heard you know more about the Gulf of Maine than do about the Maine Bay Woods. Um, so what we're doing is, is this year, later this year, we'll release a 30 meter high resolution map forest type, first ever uh, for Maine. Uh, we'll also map the forest carbon. We're going to talk about carbon projects or uh, impacts of harvesting or elsewhere. We can start with a very baseline. 
Second thing is data nice and not uh, bug. We uh, need data for and information for as well. Um, decision support. We talk about that in the group. So another part of what the center is doing is to talk about uh, online, open source interface. So that people, the public, landowners, uh, people from the way, can actually interface with this data to support uh, long term information. So, turn it back over to him. Great. Well, so well, thank you, Aaron, for that, by the way. Um, my office works a lot on climate change. Actually, Hassan Rose is in, our, in the audience who runs our um, science and technical subcommittee. Um, what we know about climate and what we have seen over the last 10 years, what we've seen over the last month, is that it is incredibly unpredictable. Our natural systems are unpredictable, our oceans are changing, our weather is changing, nests are changing. So, how to each of you, or whoever wants to jump in, the unpredictability of climate and some of our natural system data. How do we work with it in the AI? Can AI manage an unpredictable system? Is it going to help us, or are there challenges? Whoever wants to go first. Well, I can, I can jump in to get things off. I mean, I think that's one of the warnings that I have always had in mind with using a lot of the AI algorithms is that they often don't perform well when you, when you give them a totally uh, out of sample type of data set. And climate change can be like that. You can have a predicted algorithm that works really well year to year, and then the ecosystem, the ocean, what have you, goes through a really sudden shift, and all of a sudden a predicted algorithm uh, can break down. And so that's, you know, I think that's part of the thread of. You know, these aren't just replacing our decision making, they, they assist with human decision making. And that AI isn't going to replace it, it's supposed to automate our decision making. So, you still need the human expertise to think about how predictions are working. Um, on the flip side, I think one of, the, one of the cool things about AI is how it can bring together really diverse uh, data sets, especially when it comes to environmental data. And so, we're working with a lot of uh, community science programs. When you have people out there monitoring the environment, you can pick up signals of, of sudden change a lot more quickly than if you're just monitoring certain uh, sampling stations. So there, there's also new potentials in it to pick up on some of the early warning signals to Great. Any others want to jump in? Yeah, I guess the point that I was going to make, uh, just like Mark, uh, in what we do, uh, dealing with uncertain systems, not being able to predict the future from the past outcomes, like that, what AI generally drives on. Uh, what I would really like to see is the development of an uh, environmental AI field. I would encourage folks like Drew, I know Kobe just tried to hire uh, environmental AI scientists to really uh, successfully find someone. I think that's where our main is really it's the intersection between the economy, the good the environment. And the use of AI to address something as important as the intervention. Top three, planet change. I think AI is really important on that. So we're really about bringing our data together, leveraging the scientists like at the Ruby or elsewhere to apply algorithms to address this. Yeah, you know, I guess on a more basic level, you know, we we spent a fair amount of our small companies spending a fair amount of resources building tools to identify fish species that the fishermen are catching um, and eventually hope to get ROI on that. And as fish species and population shift, we're going to have to continually update that and have to be pretty agile and adaptable. But one of the things you know, we're thinking about doing is you know, when we're putting into work to identify a cod or a haddock, we're trying to make sure that that's replicable for other species down the line because we, we know things are going to change. Great. Well, thank you. And I will just say, uh, from the state level, your understanding of the change of the species is what we are already behind in. We're trying to predict how to manage them from the state level and federal level. So just thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I want to maybe start out with Ashley. I will say that part of the panel before us was about the workforce. Um, and all of the industries which you all work in and are studying are people out using their hands, their boats. Uh, they're aquaculturists, they're working in the woods. So talk a little bit about what this shift will mean for our natural heritage industries from your perspective. You talked a little bit about how this was a job that uh, growing up in Rosie County, you didn't imagine was possible. What will the future look like for your mail? What will the future of AI mean for the kinds of jobs uh, that populate Rosie County? 
I'm especially excited um, for what it could mean in terms of quality control. Um, one of my mentors when I started at the mill told me, I'm paraphrasing here, but there's something along the lines of it takes us a few decades to grow a tree and only a couple of seconds to process it, and we have an obligation to try to get that right. So I'm excited about the way that we can start collecting more data from our machines and more data on our lumber and figure when there's deviations in the process faster and try to get those things in control as soon as we can. Anybody else want to weigh in on what AI means for the people working on the ocean in the woods? Um, but I think the way we're approaching it is, you know, one boat at a time, putting camera systems out there, we're collecting a baseline of data. There's also a ton of metadata that we're collecting. We're looking to utilize that data and provide it back to the people that are out there working in the form of analytics, business analytics, how many fish you caught here, how many fish you caught there, and try to tease out patterns that the workers on the water can actually use themselves. Um, and then the, the other component is um, historically in the United States and in most countries that pay attention to managing their fisheries, uh, managing them pretty conservatively. Um, fish are, you know, they're underwater and they move around, they really are. Hard to manage, so um, there's a lot of uh, conservative measures that go into setting allocations for how much fish you can catch. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that the more data we have and the, the more information we have, we can actually start to allow our working fishermen and women out there fish closer to uh, the maximum sustainable yield or closer to the line of sustainability and control food stall businesses. I guess just the final is a, a one term I'm not crazy about. It's very good in the industry because it's the future. Future yeah. industry. It's, it's often been pulled back and, and traditional. Um, so, so the way that I thought about this is we've kind of gone from blue collar jobs to white collar jobs. And what I'm really excited about is green collar jobs. So I think by some of the sort of generation that we obviously climate change, they burn from day one and they have a strong run ethic. And now you're seeing corporations now talk about the ESP, which I think in this trip was when you talk about this issue that we're facing with. So I think in this green collar job, we can really pitch to the technology and other firms to really get people that might be in Southern Portland that not, may not know about this or the North Wing Woods. You use AI to solve a platform. So I really encourage it looks like the group with others to kind of build a platform so that we can continue to do what yeah, I'll just add one thought. Um, I think there's also this role of communication between these different silos. I know there's a lot of um, there's skepticism, uh, not just to, uh, AI, but to kind of modeling data in general from different communities. Uh, you know, they'll say things like, oh, so and so up in their office made some decision they have to make it based on modeling some data, and that doesn't always sit well with people. And so I think there's a role for, you know, Communities like who's in this room now to go to the fisherman forum or whatever the you know the appropriate cross fertilization is that has to happen just to build trust between people who are uh, using data and using algorithms and the people who are sometimes providing the data and who are often affected by the decisions made but from the data and from the methods. That said, uh, we have time. I know we're we're I'm. This panel is standing between you and the bar, but um, we have time for a couple of questions. We got a million of them. All right, uh, right there in the red. Um, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate the chance to be an audience member. Um, so, so much of the language around artificial intelligence assumes intelligence to be a, a human uh, faculty, but there are so many other kinds of intelligence down in nature collective intelligence like swarms of bees, uh, uh, smooth fit, murmurations of, of starlings, uh, the, the fungal networks that trees use to talk to each other. And I'm wondering if in your work you have special insight into being able to model that and how that differs from talking about the model of the brain, which is kind of the, the default. I'm supposed to repeat the question for the people on the internet. So, uh, Aaron, you kick it off. Repeat the question and then answer. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's, it's an insightful idea that um, basically nature creates complex patterns that maybe people have been able to mimic if they want to just spend it in the pattern of the world. Um, 
I would say we don't know enough, really. I would say we probably, as you heard from the previous speaker, uh, we still don't know much about uh, the human mind. I would say we know even less about nature. Just for an example, uh, right now, uh, the basic inventory we get to assess many for us, uh, we just got to 2021. So we're all in two years past. You might say, well, why don't we go to new settlements? Uh, unfortunately, uh, up in northern Maine, it's either cloudy or uh, you got snow in front of them. So uh, basically, using my that data, uh, we would say about 68 or 70 damage treatments to know how that's communication. So even having the most basic data to understand the processes and understand how these things are all happening. So let's go up to this. I think it's a great idea, and then I'm going to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just add, it's a really active area of research. AI is going through human bus cycles, and right now we're in a boom cycle with neural networks, which is based on biology, but there's all, I'm sure you probably know there's other AI algorithms based on um, evolution, based on uh, swarms. We have a project right now by below that we're looking at uh, Antarctic pearl swarms and how they have them collected, you know, using data from the field, and how they have a collective intelligence and how that helps them adapt and respond to the environment. I wouldn't say uh, the pearl swarm is going to be the next neural network in the AI space, but there is, uh, you know, there still is a spectrum of research that's happening and that's active. And, you know, neural networks are have taken off right now, and at some point it'll level off, and someone will come up with a new innovation in 10 or 20 or 30 years, and, you know, we'll all be gathered in a room like this really excited about that. And a lot of those ideas do come from the natural world. One more question. All right, great. The other questions, please throw them on the table. Thanks. Uh, it's Tom Wall from the Chinese Um I'm wondering where you guys see the future of uh, autonomous resource management and sustainable harvest or AI facilitated harvest, and maybe something about like horizons of where that tech might be, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Someday we're going to have robots flying, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the biggest issue you as you talk to anyone in the industry is the workforce. Um, so I know in Finland they just set the first autonomous harvester to do a, a basically uh, cutting trees. It's a little bit easier in Finland because we've got three species and, and they're fairly uniform. Uh, Maine has well over 20 different species of just the like, cotton and the, the whitefish. Uh, just separating that up is critical. Uh, same to go with that as well as terms of automation. So, JD Irving, I think, is one of the first to essentially track a tree as it goes from the forest to the mill to the final product for that whole chain of custody. Uh, as we talk about carbon counting. I think it's incredible that that's the future for a lot of us. People using robots right now to in, in southern pine plantations, basically the robot walk between the rows and assess the bigger, and so you have very targeted fertilization of other activities that are being addressed this week. It clearly is the future. It will change the industry. Mark, robot fishery. Yeah, it's the Yeah, uh, well, uh, there's a ton of autonomous monitoring that we have been happening already. Um, that's, that's really gained a lot of traction in the last couple of years, and there's you know, the natural trend to go towards harvesting. Um, I think it is it, it's occurring, it's starting to happen. Um, once again, it's, it's a hard problem to solve because um, it's the ocean, it's so unpredictable, so it's going to be a really, really challenging. Uh, thing to accomplish, and you know, as far as you know, we're sitting here in Maine. Um, I'm not sure that Maine will be the leader in that charge. I think there's uh, a lot of pride in the hard work they do on the water, and the amount of intuition, skill, and the ability to to adapt to kind of a moment's notice and actually do something completely different than an algorithm might have said you should do um, is really important. And um, I think that will be a long time before we get there. Actually, any other comments on that? Uh, on a similar line, 
there's uh, there is uh, AI detection and like legal phishing that happens not in the Gulf of Maine, but then it's global international law. So that's kind of another uh, dimension of the same same problem. Great. Well, thank you all for listening. Please give a big round of applause for all. Thank you all for coming to the State of AI and me, and come to join us for leverage and stay and talk to all our panelists and guests, and thank you for coming.